Hello and welcome to an all English Järnväike special. My name is Helle Stenklöv and I participated in and recorded the Midgårdsbrot music panel this year. Before we go, I've got a message for you. To survive as a metal podcast, Järnväike is in need of donations. Food stores and car sellers aren't that interested in heavy metal, but hopefully you are. I've made a Patreon page, so if you'd like to share a few dollars to keep Järnverke going, I'd be very thankful. Go to patreon.com slash Järnverke, J-E-R-N-V-E-R-K-E-T, I know, to donate. All the information you need is listed in the episode description. Again, thanks for all the donations. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. Okay, so the sound quality of this recording didn't turn out that good. I'm sorry for that. I've done what I could to save it though, and hopefully it's an interesting discussion to listen to despite the sucky sound. And for um, Mick Osbrookville House Nussle. Um, so yeah, this is a talk about the past, present and future of metal, which is kind of like everything. So yeah, a broad subject. So... Uh, so I'm going to just start get a bit of bearings to introduce everyone. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Selzer. Uh, 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 I'm the views editor of Metal in the UK. Uh, before that, I was the uh, editor of Terrorizer in the UK. So I've been doing this for um, yeah quite a long time. And um, grinding coffee? I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to do uh, the rest of the panel. Introduce themselves, uh, starting with you, Suzanne. Okay, so I'll start. My name is Suzanne. I work in um, this huge radio station, actually, Radio Rock. It's commercial radio, and this festival was totally denied from my boss. He said it was too narrow and too weird. I was totally provoked, and I said, this is just an extension of what we play, which is basically Iron Maiden, Metallica, and Black Sabbath. Before that, I used to work at Elm Street, legendary metal pub here in, no, here, not here, in Oslo. Uh, but I started after the satanic era. Hi, I'm Michael, and I work at the label Season of Best for, well, since it was created. Hi, I'm uh, Hella Stenklöv. Uh, I've been a metal and hard rock journalist for 15, 16 years. In the last seven, I've done a show called The Järnverke. First on radio, but now it's a podcast. Uh, gives me more possibilities to do whatever I want with the format and not be as Susanna here. She used to work there too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Eva Bjornsson. Uh, my day job is in Slave. And I also play Project uh, Assembly to play their first day. Um, I run a label called By Norse Music, which releases, among other things, Varluna. Uh, and I work with a management company called Aisa. We manage some Norwegian and Swedish artists like Ora Brot, Karin Park, and some others. Um, yeah, and uh, I really like to be at Nigel. Hi, my name is Dale Patterson. Uh, I've been writing about metal since the early 2000s in fanzines and magazines like Metal Hammer and... Uh, Decibel and Terrorizer, and about five years ago I wrote a book called Black Metal Evolution of the Cult, and the same year I founded a publishing house called Cult Will Never Dies, which is uh, pretty much the only um, publishing house dedicated to books and fanzines about metal and metal subculture. So yeah, so um, I think we're going to talk about metal as a continuity and break that down, but um, yeah, Midgard's Blood is a perfect place to think, you know, for think of metal as a continuity, you know, I think that means that one of the one of the strengths about heavy metal is that everyone has a strong sense of the past. You know, all you know, a lot of the great bands they refer back to the, the history they draw from it, and that's what's kept it a um, a very a dynamic genre for the past forty years. And so, 
know, there's been some bumps along the way and a lot, lot of uh, reactions and counter reactions. But I was wondering if you feel that with a new generation of bands, that whether that's changing a lot, whether bands coming along who aren't so much interested in the original past and the history, and they're just, um, you know, whether it's kind of metalcore or just bringing in new genres into it. And are we seeing a kind of a change in the nature of heavy metal? Um, I'm going to start with Michael because you've um, been running a label, so you probably on the, see this on the ground a lot more. Yeah, well, first, it's a tricky question. First, I'm going to say that metal is very conservative. People want to listen to the same thing that they listened to 20 years ago. And the demographic of heavy metal, like when you see the festivals like that, it's getting older. On the other hand, there's been a new generation coming up. Uh, we see this in the numbers. Like there's now, when you go to festivals, there, there's been a renewal. You have some 25-year-old girl that's going to, they're not going to worship Emperor, but they're going to worship M. Glau or Batane. They are following the path, but they don't have the same reference or colors. But it's definitely a genre where there's a renewal, and that's why this dichotomy, this paradox, is why you have a very strong physical aspect in heavy metal, where you have an older generation that's still attached to the options, and you have a new generation that will never buy a vinyl, but is streaming. It's just, it's just a continuity. There's been a renewal, we definitely. We see that in all mail order. We, I can draw statistics, and I look at somebody who's having his, like, his 18th birthday and buying Dark World on the place of the normal sky. For her or him, it's not going to be as important as it was to me when it was released and it was like groundbreaking. But they still study their history after they go through the gateway events. Yeah. I mean, Suzanne, you, um, I mean, you've been working with uh, a radio station, I believe it was called the Metallica yeah, station. Yeah, and that's uh, quite uh, suitable, I think. I wore this today. No Lives Matter. I saw Gary Holt of Slayer wearing this at Tons of Rock. And I went straight to eBay and ordered <laughs> to me and my best friend. I could have worn the Kill the Kardashian shirt because it's it's a thing here. I think that for us, and I can just look at the audience here, uh, heavy metal is more than just music because we went into it either being bullied, have some darkness in us. It was it was a, f a freak show back just 20 years ago. I'm 38. I'm born in 81. And I have to admit, I discovered Metallica through the Black Album. But then again, I dived into it, and I and it just I found my place musically. But now it's different because they don't have that basic um, darkness. I think it was that it's not for it's not narrowed down to people with the urge, and, and they they don't need to be. Um, out of this bully situation. I think metal for very uh, many of us comes from being bullied or having some issues in our teens and we just flock together in this place where we found uh, similar people and uh, darkness in the music that we can ent identify. Well, I think this is an important point in that the way we discover music um, affects a lot the way we relate to it. Um, you know, back in the day, we had the, the tape trading. You had to, um, you know, you had to really try hard, and you had, and you also you had the anticipation. And then this scene is very hard to get into the small environments. You know, it's, it's uh, we have been very uh, ex excluded, and like we have, uh, it's it's not just to show up at this uh, Mayhem concert in in the nineties nineties and uh, and and be. Uh, Loud mouthed, or as I saw enslaved for the first time at the Fox Festival, I think in 2004, daytime uh, at one o'clock, I guess. And it was just amazing to see this band in daylight. And from that, that from then, it just I don't listen so much to metal at home, uh, I don't uh, wash the floors with it, but it, it takes me back to a place that I treasure. So when the uh, radio station I work for uh, plays so much Metallica and Maiden, it's kind of hard for me because I treasure this uh, music, but um, I have to admit, it's all about money now, 
and we can't claim uh, music the way we did back in the days because it's commercialized. The bands that we started to uh, adore and gave us meaning is now uh, well, too huge, you know? Yeah, well, I, th I think this is uh, something that's happened, you know, when kind of metal first started, or when it, most things started out, there's a tribalism. And, um, you know, as um, the scene gets kind of a bit more democratized with, you know, with streaming, but it just, just kind of to go back to my point, that, you know, when, you, when you're tape trading, you know, there was a lot of um, people, you know, you have to be very heavily invested into it. So now we have this paradox where you have everything in your fingertips, uh, but um, there's less sense of uh, attachment, is it maybe less sense of attachment to kind of scenes and it affects like how music is created or how music is, is, is listened to. But hello, I mean, you, you've worked in the radio and now you're working in podcasts. Um, so, you know, there's, there's kind of like, you can kind of narrow cast a little bit. You know, you, you know, there's, there's more, do you find you working, moving from radio to podcast, you're finding a more dedicated um, audience and there's a bit deeper you can, you can go that maybe Suzanne can't? Yeah, you could say that. Uh, but my show has always been very narrow and I have never played anything I don't like myself. So I've avoided the, the Black Album and uh, Core and uh, uh, Five Finger Death Punch and so on. But what I've seen is that uh, the recruitment to the metal scene is different over the world. In Norway, the metal fans are getting older and in general, not all of you, of course, because you're here, uh, they stop discovering new bands. And there isn't a very big recruitment of new Norwegian bands these days. Not good ones, anyway. Um, <laughs> but if you go further south in Europe, the, uh, the audience is a lot younger. So there are differences, too, be between the countries, I think, and then we, we can see more uh, bands coming from further south or maybe South America, uh, the US. So, yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I think the, the, the underground is somewhat decreasing in Norway, but maybe growing in other countries. Do you want to Yes. Yeah, I think I have the same observation that Norway is a little bit uh, standing a little bit still, but <clears throat> there are new and interesting bands coming, but they are they seem to be a little bit more left field. But it's wait, sorry, experimental. I don't mean, do you see a difference in age in your group, in your target group, when you play Norway or Germany or Southern Europe? An age difference for public or not really? Not really, for our kind, no. Because Enslaved is, is, is a great band, you know? That too. I, tr I tried to argument to my boss that Enslaved was playing and they were also touring with Vegelista back in for some years ago. And he said, it doesn't matter because we don't uh, take any consideration to uh, what's uh, not selling. There's a robot in London so it's, uh, narrowing out the, the songs that people listen to for more than 15 minutes before they change the channel. So Helle was in uh, our station for one year. Uh, and it was just amazing because we had like this two hour whole space with, uh, with, with true Norwegian metal and, and she knows her shit, you know? But it does, uh, not just Norwegian metal, I mean, I know, she's the best in Norway, I think. But it was not good enough for commercial radios. This is, uh, the metal scene is for uh, the, the, the youngsters that doesn't, that doesn't need to have this, um, heart for their music I think. they can also dig uh, Britney Spears well I mean oh, Diane yeah. Yeah. Who I mean Diane you, you've been kind of heavily involved in the underground scene uh, for quite a while you know for, 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 since 2000 and you're also working putting on gigs in, you know, very underground gigs in the UK um, how do you feel um, the scene's bringing in you, into, the, into the underground and kind of bypassing the gateway bands and going straight into so it seems a, the underground seems a very vibrant scene. There's been a revival of kind of a cult death metal, and you know, uh, black metal still a powerful thing on the you know on the very much more underground side of things. So, uh, do you see people coming, new people coming into that scene? Is it just an aging? No, I think it's, it's absolutely. Um, there is a new generation of uh, fans who have come to 
agency and uh, I think for example the, uh, the Mayhem shows where they were playing the Mysterious, that could have been purely a um, nostalgia trip for the people in their 30s and 40s but there were a lot of kids there, teenagers, early 20s uh, fans. So I think one of the strengths of black metal and death metal and you know underground metal in general is that unlike for example hip hop there is a real respect for um, what came before and a kind of understand that uh, you can't just jump in and uh, kind of forget about the people that paved the way. So even though you might get into black metal via Maguire or Matushka or um, Guado or something like this, if you're in your 20s, there is a sort of understanding that you then have to go back and listen to Dark Throne, and, you know, uh, and which is, you know, from our point of view, is good because our books exist to kind of give that context. And I think one issue with the internet is although it makes it much easier for people to discover metal, discover very extreme metal and, and most obscure recordings, you do kind of lose that context. Whereas before you would be given music by somebody you knew perhaps, and you, or you'd read a magazine and get a cover of this, and there was something more context to where the culture and the band uh, in question would come from. Now you can kind of lose the context because you discover one band, you don't realise that they're maybe a carbon copy of another better band. Uh, and so I think that, that that's the only thing uh, negative I see. But, but in terms of increasing the band base, at least in the UK, there's much, the shows are much bigger than they used to be. The yeah. So I, mean, I, I think that's positive. Yeah, I mean, the power of metal is that it stands for something. Um, and more, like, like you said, more than the music. I mean, uh, Metal Hammer, when you had the censors, uh, like few, the one before that where they managed to get Jedi announced as a religion, and um, we, got, we got the numbers. And so we tried to get heavy metal as a religion, get people to um, put down heavy metal as a religion on the censors. But the underlying principle of that is that heavy metal is a value system as much as music. And I'm kind of wondering with a new generation of bands, are we losing, starting to lose the aspects of it? People, I mean, do you feel like, can you play metal riffs and not be a metal band? Can you not be, can you not uh, play exactly metal riffs? So look at all of it, you know, they still get the old, old school crowd and they understand it. But why, like, would they be considered still in the metal realm where people would um, maybe think, put it for my Valentine, they wouldn't consider them a metal band in any meaningful sense. Eva. Yeah, I come from a background where uh, I was, you know, like black metal back then. It was about the content, you know, the ideology and uh, why people were doing the band. So um, I remember somebody mentioned that Sammy Davis Jr. was a member of Church of Satan. So that's pretty metal, we thought. <laughs> more metal than a lot of, of metal um, and, and I think you know that's I thought there's a Swedish uh, writer I can't remember his name now but he writes for close up and he has a thing on his uh, on his blog or whatever that's called involuntarily metal which I think is very de descriptive like stuff that's outside of metal but it's just so good that it's metal and I kind of I kind of enjoy that terminology for me it's you know Sometimes it goes too far. When anything can be metal, I guess. It's just art that really uh, conveys really strong emotions and make me react. I, I get I get that feeling like, oh, this is this is metal. And it might not be distorted guitars, uh, double um, bass drum, and all that, but um, it's definitely more of a, of a feeling. And I think I don't I don't really mind that. Metal becomes different things. You know, I don't really see the point in spending time arguing online. Ever. Ever. <laughs> That's, but especially not like, is this metal? You know, if somebody thinks it's metal, then it's, you know, a subjective little world of that being metal, and that's fine. You know, I might not subscribe to it myself, but uh, if, if there's one thing the metal scene does need is, is like bickering about if the other guys are metal. Yeah, but we we do. Yeah. You know, I don't mean, I, you know, I do it, 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 quite a lot online myself. Yeah, you know, but I mean, I mean, like, do we need like a kind of a even like you know, there are certain bands that aren't metal that every metal head gets on a kind of a spiritual level. Dead can dance, Filter Nephilim, weirdly woven hand. One of my favourite all-time bands is 
stupendously Christian band, the more you're into black metal and the more satanic you are, the more likely you're going to get them. And he quite likes the fact that black metal people get them. So do we, do we need like a more communal idea of what is metal, rather well, than everyone just going, this is metal, this is metal? So we don't actually lose the meaning of what metal stands for? Yeah. I, I don't really think so. I think it's good that, uh, um, I hate that word really, the, the metal community has become more diverse, that you're actually allowed to like different kinds of music and uh, your, um, you yourself can decide what you think is metal and not. We're not there anymore that everyone has Iron Maiden and Judas Priest in common. Uh, maybe there are even people that never have heard Judas Priest liking metal metal today. So I don't know that the, the thing about defining metal all the time that that is kind of an elite question, or you have uh, have had to listen to metal to forty in forty years to uh, know anything. Uh, I, I saw that when I was younger and I went to shows with older bands. They were like, oh, but you're too young to go to this show. You don't, you can't possibly know anything about metal. And I was like, uh, okay. So <laughs> in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's great that uh, people's horizons are broadening. Uh, metal is whatever you want it to be. So, uh, and it's, um, it's more like a personality thing. I don't give a fuck. I listen to metal. That's why. But, but I think there is kind of a... Uh, you have to distinguish between metal as a culture and metal as a, as an, um, a music form. You know, you, you could make... Um, you can make metal if you'd only listen to Five Finger Death Punch. It would, it would still be technically metal. It wouldn't be very good, but it would still be <laughs> technically metal. But I think one thing which is a slightly problematic uh, from the perspective of someone who is from uh, an underground metal background is that there's a certain co-option uh, taking place. I think within, for example, a lot of American bands, they want to call themselves black metal because they like the weight that carries and the kind of historical gravity of it. But they also want to sort of piss on the um, ideologies and the uh, values of the older bands. Uh, you know, for example, Corpse Paint, they, they would see this as being immature Satanism, the occult, they would, they would see that, you know, there's a lot of bands who are talking about how they are taking black metal into a different place, which is fine, and I think, you know, everyone's free to do what they want, but there is a there is an aspect, uh, yeah, where I think it is co-option, where you are taking the music out of the culture, but then sort of paying disrespect to, to that culture. Because, uh, yeah, because... You're probably more at the forefront of this because, um, you know, Season the Mist, they've always had like a lot of those great old school bands, but your roster has been also kind of very progressive. You have bands like Fosco who've kind of gone beyond what would be a traditional metal framework, Souls to Fear as well. And I'm just wondering what, what is your criteria? Do you still, um, for like signing bands and um, still keeping it, keeping an identity? Like, you know, single identity with a very diverse and progressive roster. All right, so it's going to take me two minutes. Okay. <laughs> First, uh, it's two factors. Uh, we're talking about metal as a value. System. Yes. I had a conversation which was eye-opening about 10 years ago with uh, the daughter of John McCain. You remember John McCain, the guy who ran versus Obama as president? I was with her daughter when they were delivering the um, inauguration speech of Obama when Obama was elected president. And I was with Century Media, but the director of Century Media who passed away a few years back. And he explained to me, and I never really fully realized until then, that Mel was a lifestyle, and that he was going to adapt his signings to the result of the American election. If Obama was going to get elected, he was going to fail, and he was going to sign a lot of golf band because people are going to be desperate. If John McCain was elected, he would have signed a lot of punk band because people would be socially angry. And what happened, and this was actually true, there's been a lot of resurgence of cold wave band in the metal a few years after Obama was elected. So that was eye-opening for me. It was like also war, crisis, metal was never affected because it's the last thing people will spend money, it's the first thing people will spend money on to say they don't agree with what's happening. So the lifestyle element, that conversation was really eye-opening for me about how important it was in people's life. 
we were selling a lifestyle. First. Second part is uh, why do we have a progressive side and a traditional side, I would say. I consider metal to be my favorite genre of music where I have the band that I like the most and also the band that I hate the most. The most cheesy and disgraceful music also comes from metal. How Sabaton, you name them. Um, you just yeah, it is also well that's happening in Germany more or less. And, uh, and, Germany is like a black hole with the 80s can't escape. Yeah, yeah. And what I've been trying to do, I would not never consider my... But, like, you take that first conversation about how the, the social part of metal, like how the environment affects what, metal, what the new bands are pulling, what they're creating, and what I'm trying to do as well is to try to steer metal into a little bit of an arty direction. I try to keep the true bands and the traditional bands to be the conservative, but I try also as well to be Sundance, not Hollywood. You know what I mean? To put the art deco. I mean, Nuclear Blast and Napalm are doing way better than me. They can work with Nightwish and uh, Slayer much better than I do. What I can do is try to be the relapse of this generation or what some of the labels are doing, like Profound Lore, to be on the forehead of the most difficult um, metal to enter into because it's an acquired taste. So that would be my two points. Uh, since you were talking about war and uh, American conflicts, I think they used uh, really hard you know, Norwegian and also other uh, pieces of uh, metal bands to torture their uh, at uh, Guantanamo Bay. Which is ironic. Like, it Chinese is Chinese water torture or or metal for days and days and days. So people go fucking nuts. And then I think there's the issue for me, especially that I wanted to t take up here because I was uh, I grew up in a Jewish family. I'm an atheist, but this Satan, uh, northern mythology, uh, it's, it's been a, a scary turf because we also now have terrorists that use our uh, Norwegian culture and heritage as an argument for being uh, the, the country we used to be or whatever. So there's, there's uh, some uh, negative uh, aspects of this scene still that really needs to be worked with. But then again, we're talking about how uh, we have to let it go. That uh, the, the metal scene and the harsh metal, like that die side, I've never even seen them or barely heard about them. But I had a really shitty day yesterday. My boyfriend broke the chair and everything. It was hell. And I saw them and we, was, and we, we had a great laugh because every time he screamed, I was just filled with like, oh, I needed this. And I had a great evening at least. My son is 10 years old and he's been with his father for uh, four weeks this summer listening to my station because he misses me. He comes back as a fan of these two bands, Volbeat and Dio. So I'm like, okay, so it's a start. And I understand it because Volbeat is easy. It's rock with pop uh, built uh, songs, I think. And, and Dio, the legend, uh, he, he doesn't know, but it's, I think it's a good start. And then I would rather see him do this than Reggie, you know? And um, I don't think we are too old to understand this shit. Because I, uh, I'm going to do this uh, very fast. James Hetfield in Trondheim a couple of weeks ago. He had, a, uh, he's, a, he's a grandfather now. And, uh, and, he, and I was, of course, waiting for Kill Em All and Master of Puppets. But then he asked the audience of 40,000 people, uh, how many of you have seen Metallica before? And it was like, and uh, how many of you have seen Metal uh, are here for the first time? And it was part, I think, 30,000 people. The first time they saw Metallica, maybe it was my eighth, I think. So this is, uh, so the, of the four, the great four, uh, Slayer, Anthrax, and uh, Megadeth, and Metallica. So they're doing uh, their work still, but we can't uh, embrace it because it's too commercialized. And that's fucking snob that's snobbish. And that's all these reasons together are, uh, is why I don't think we should uh, have certain borders in metal because it's individual and you have to start somewhere to become a, a metalhead. Uh, every, each and every one of us have started somewhere with a band we think is stupid now. And that's probably what's happening to the younger people discovering it today too. They're just starting with other bands. And to be uh, true, <laughs> you, you need to have something to hate, as you said, but you also need to have something to love. 
and we don't have to be friends like every each and every one of us. We 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 need to feel a little bit of of hate towards our non-favorite bands and love to the bands we love. Mm. But you know, I mean, obviously, there's a sense of like the power of festivals like this, and the power of going to gigs in the metal scene is having a sense of community and just being able to see someone and know we're on the same wavelength. Um, Evo. Yeah, I just wanted to offer a little bit different perspective. Maybe it's Bergen is more hippie-like, I don't know. But uh, I don't really recognize the entirety of this uh, exclusion uh, sort of feeling that, that I hear a little bit about now. Because for me, for us in the extreme metal scene back then, it was, it's been portrayed as very you know, elitist and, and all this inner circle, blah, blah, blah. But that's a bit of a misunderstanding, I think. It's, the whole thing is like to be sort of respected you had to deliver something musically it was the only thing that you could do wrong was to portray yourself as something you were not hence us never having been black metal you know we've lost we've lost uh, quite a few um, newspaper pages because they're like we want to do a big feature we want to talk to a black metal band and then I'm like do you want me to give you some numbers yeah. And they're like, but can't we just say that you're black metal for the sake of, no, we can't do that? What, if, what about saying you wear black metal? They go all the way. And they say, no, we, we're not black metal. And then they go, oh, yes, we, we can't, can't feed you with that. But that's, that's the, like, it's not elitism in that sense, but it's more like respect for what people expect to find. And the only bands that got shit from this so-called inner circle what the bands that just started off because they thought corpse paint was cool they wanted to be scary or something like that and they didn't have like the musicality to follow up on it then they would get sort of the cold shoulder or whatever but but you know bands like that you know they don't tend to last you know at metal hammer we're having a great big debate about you know our bands going to be you know how long are bands going to have um, a lot of bands they tend to peter out for two or three albums You've been going for nearly 30 years, yeah. and um, but uh, you know, as a creative force, but still kind of you know, still wacky, yeah. you know. So, but you know, so you, you you know, you've kept a core, but you have managed to expand out of it. And so, for bands who are starting and want to know how, how long they're going to have in this, what advice would you give to bands? You know, to be a you know, to be still be able to go 25 years from now with a very constantly changing landscape that we're dealing with. Yeah, advice from uh, the old farts is always interesting for the new bands. <laughs> like they the love first, it. The first advice is always don't listen to the old farts. But uh, I, I think um, having toured with quite a few bands that I th think was really, really good. And um, I was thinking, I hope these guys make it for a long time. And then, and then they quit after a while. And it's so, sort of the thing that you see is um, you have to, as in all, in all where we say, you have to... Uh, Divide between the must mustache and the snot. <laughs> what a stupid expression. We also talk about having beards in the mailbox, so there you go. But um, first you have to have the artistic foundation. You have to have something you really believe in, that you feel, you know, to use the um, <clears throat> My Little Pony language. Uh, you have to feel it in your heart. That you, there's something you really feel strongly about. You want to go to that rehearsal place and you want to work with it because you love what's coming out of it. You love your art. But then there's the other thing. It's like the world is not fair. It was a little bit fair in, in the 90s, I would say, because then if you got the right tour and there wasn't so many bands, so it was easier, and, and you worked hard, you would have a sort of a, a um, progression. Hard work would give you something back. Now it's not necessarily that anymore. You have to have that second level where you have your artistic thing, but you need to start. You need to listen to people who knows what's going on. If your ambition is to reach as many people as possible, you need to hook up with people who know how to reach as many people as possible. So that sort of, I think that's uh, maybe it's a. Uh, um, nasty to say, but I think some young bands today, because of the, you see the internet and you see a band popping out of, yeah, like, uh, yeah, like Heilung, a couple of years ago they played their first, or second show, second show. Second show. at Mimia Flut, some people became aware of them, and now, a couple of years later, they're like the biggest thing happening. So people see this, this, this 
quick climb that bands do. And they get very, you know, jealous. Of course you get jealous. I get jealous of Hilo. For God's sake, having worked for such a long time. Yeah, but Hilo, Hilo was an anomaly. Yeah, exactly. It's not a rule, it's an anomaly. It's an anomaly, exactly. But people, they see, like, how easy, in a sense, how fast you can go, and then they get frustrated. But it's, you know, you need the know-how. So you need the, if you want to become uh, a bigger band, stay stay true to your art, but also have sort of the guts to listen to people who tell you, like, this won't get you anywhere, or, or stuff like that. Listen, you know, I'm not saying to go on, is that the expression, go on accord with your art, but uh, you have to, uh, you have to listen. But if you were like a small new starting band, you see Harlow, you think, well, if they could do it, I could do it. But they may, they're probably taking the wrong lessons from it. Because obviously the amount of work and thought that goes into Hilo, um, and you know, you can sense it. You can sense when a band it's their life, and you know that they put their they put their everything into it. Uh, it's also timing, because it's like the yeah. advertisement business. When you see a band that's doing great, then it's way too late for you to have that idea. That means that they had it many years before, and now they're reaping sort of the rewards for it. So there's I mean, also something. There's no point in studying what's hot and trying to emulate it. Yeah. It's way too late. Yeah. I mean, Michael, you must have like a big slash parlor band, and you must come across different kinds of attitudes. Like, but I think sometimes I kind of feel new bands that have a sense of entitlement. Um, and do you do you see that um, in bands kind of wanting to kind of be big too quick and thinking that they've they earned the right? Well, it happens all the time, but yeah, it's completely unfair. Like uh, how long is uh, it's like becoming viral with a video? It's a complete accident. You had like uh, three factors that came in at the right time, the right place. The Star Wars line it was something that's never gonna happen again. Uh, we were happy to in the history of a label, but it happened a couple of times. We Patain back in the days, maybe I don't know. Souls of Fear also Ben Square. It just popped up and it just happened. You wish it would happen for every band, but really there's no rule. Even if you have the art, the music, and uh, and you're doing the hard work, you might not succeed. Because I think more than ever, it's a chaotic, random business than it's ever been. So there's not really any advice I could give. Yeah, hard work and listen to people, but that's not a guarantee for success. That's uh, sad. I mean, uh, Ellie, you know, doing a podcast, you probably have like a bit more of a, uh, like a bond with your audience. Close. I mean, how, how do you feel this works and what you're playing? Like, what, what do you find becomes like the most like the best points that everyone kind of rallies around? On your podcast, uh, can you say that last part again? So, what do you what, like? What do you feel like are the big running points uh, for your podcast? If you had like one or two things, bands that would, you, you feel that would define what you're trying to do with your podcast, and um, I think that's kind of difficult to know what what uh, what does that, uh, your band is the one that people uh, put to their chests or uh, which episodes are going to be the most popular sometimes i get surprised that like why isn't the the episode with uh, europe's joey tempest it's not popular at all but uh, the one i had with uh, like one tail one head it was very popular and uh, so i think that's it, it depends on which kind of people that are listening to the podcast so they are maybe not that uh mainstream if you want to use that word so i don't know if you can use my podcast to see who's going to be popular and not because i <laughs> as i said i'm so, i sometimes get surprised by which episodes that are popular and and not not like the big ones i thought would be but maybe the smaller weirder ones or the ones that rarely give interviews yeah oh, yeah i mean it's a, it's a big thing i mean sometimes you know like the more you drill down at the underground that's where you get the most obsessive audiences uh you know there's a book called niche that if you're working in any kind of media i recommend to anyone listen to it it's about like how everyone kind of like if you, if you try to be everything to everyone you'll fail and it's the ones who appeal to obsessive like the long end of the tail that's that's you know you always find people who will just like buy everything like you know Michael, you put out box sets, and they, and when you're wondering about people like buying music, like your box sets, because they, they go, I'm, they must go really quickly. Yeah, they do, they do well. You know, you know, so we kind of, find, and you know, Midgar's Blood is a good example of, totally of this. 
Yeah, this is, you know, but, you know, Midgar's got kind of... Kyle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, you must have found this with your, with your, um... Were you surprised by the popularity of, um, the books you had? Um, no, it's a very good book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it, it is true that I think, uh, I think the success of... But it's counterintuitive. Like, if you took a yeah. publisher and go, right, I'm going to give you a biography of um, Moonspell or Russian Christ, they'd be like, huh? But I think actually that's easier to target people and you, you, you're easy to find who's interested. I think in a way that, in the same way that people buy box sets and vinyls, you know, for albums they really like, I think people are now more willing to buy, say, a book rather because you don't have to buy, let's say, a weekly magazine to find out the list of them. So you kind of, it's it, you sort of invest a little bit more in things that will last. And um, I think it's much easier to be, I mean, go, to go back to black metal, you know, some of those codes, uh, the aesthetics and the, uh, the lyrics and the way they kind of traditionally uh, project themselves, part of that is kind of sort of marketing. You know, it's much easier to be a death metal band or a black metal band than be somewhere in between and not, you know, not have a clear demographic because it is quite tribal, I think, the metal audience. Um, so, yeah, I think it does help to have a niche in metal. But I don't think you should be limited to that. You know, I think as long as it's, it's okay to be, to work within a niche, but not not to the point where you feel limited. I think as soon as you're an artist and you feel you can't try something because it's you know, not metal or not. Uh, I think there's a bit of fear sometimes of kind of leaving metal. Or, and I don't think uh, that you, know, you don't have to listen to metal all the time. So and actually, most of the black metal bands that were really important, um, they didn't necessarily take most of their inspirations from, from metal. So I think it's, yeah, yeah. It's, good, it's good not to be afraid to kind of... Yeah. Yeah, one of us was a big um, Hard Rock fan. Yeah, Tangerine Dream. Tangerine Dream, yeah. That was, uh, was, was, that, was that the record on his record in terms of Was it was Klaus Schultz, I think. I have the record, actually. Yeah, was it Klaus Schultz? Yeah, no, it's the third album by uh, Tangerine Dream. So I actually want to talk about this because, you know, the Lords of Chaos movie came out recently. Um, <laughs> the, Lords of Chaos, the Lords of Chaos movie came out recently. And, uh, you know, if you're a black metal fan, that's, it's a, almost like a creation myth. It's almost like you're Robert Johnson at the crossroads. And, you know, talking about kind of elitism, I think elitists get a bad rap sometimes. Like, no black male is going to call themselves we are non-elite black metal. So I think sometimes you need elitists to kind of like, you know, be on North Star. But, you know, every, everyone has a, a you know, every, whether you've seen the movie or not, you're going to have a very complex relationship to it. Whether it's like, whether you feel the story needs to be told, whether the story's been told right, you know, historically or whether or with the emphasis on where it's being put. And I just wanted to go, kind of go down the panel and ask, like, whether you've seen it, why you haven't seen it, if you haven't, if you have, how you kind of felt about it. I'm going to start with um, Eva because uh, there's like lots of cutaway scenes of Bergen and it's a lot of Bergen in there and we tell them all of that. Yeah, <clears throat> I wish uh, John Goodman could have played me in it. That would have been awesome. <laughs> then I would have seen it, but uh, I haven't and I, I, and I want. Um, it's not to do with like black metal pride or anything like that, but it's just uh, for me. It's um, a history of uh, some very close friends that uh, their lives took a very bad turn. Uh, so I just can't bring myself to to go. I ate a lot of popcorn, but I'm not going to do that and watch that. It's just for me. It just stepped over the line of what constitutes entertainment for me, personally. Suzanne? Okay, so I saw it twice. And um, I'm too young to be uh, a part of the scene like uh, Eva was. But then again, I got to know uh, one of the characters very well. Um, and I, his murder was this film in the film. And uh, uh, that was the reason why I had to see it twice, because I had to shut it off. Even though I knew the movie is like if you saw the dirt. Uh, uh, so it's kind of, 
ridiculous in one way because it starts. Uh, it's, you, you see the scenography and the way you guys look here. They do it really well, but it's very, it's it's ridiculous in one way. But then again, I was uh, introduced to some uh, aspects of uh, the story around Mayhem and and Girish um, Pigrif, or like I like to call him. Uh, it was. I like the fact that they hired a not fat Jew to play Greven. Um, I thought, th think that was kind of funny, but um, and then again, it was it was. It's a movie about something we maybe know too well, but for other fans of, of Norwegian metal, it, I would think it's quite entertaining, and that's a very uh, ambivalent to, to watch. Uh, Michael, you. You've had Mayhem on your label for many years. So Twenty. Twenty years. So uh, Twenty years. This must have been... How was it for you watching? Well, I, uh, obviously, I've been working... Um, I've been working with Mayhem for 20 years. I don't really know if I have an opinion. I like the movie. I was not involved in the history back then. I know all the guys. Everybody told me which detail is right, which detail is wrong, but I don't really care. The only thing... Uh, my taste doesn't really matter in this conversation. The only thing I can say is that we... When we talked with Sony, it was like, okay, there's this Mayhem movie coming up that's going to make it big, we're going to create campaigns, Spotify playlists around it, try to do our job. That movie has been preaching to the choir, so that means it didn't bring Mayhem a single new fan. The people who've seen that movie are the people who knew about Mayhem and they want to have an opinion about the movie. There's not really people who didn't know about the story, discovered it with the movie and went to listen to Mayhem. That didn't there was no bump on Spotify weekly playlists or shit like that. It, it really didn't. I'm not saying this was for promotion for Mayhem. It, it established them to people who were already fans. It didn't bring any new people it, to the table. It wasn't really interested in the music, was it? Like, um, no. no. I, mean, I, I, I have a little skin in the game because I wrote the sleeve notes for the, um, the, the Blu-ray release. Yeah. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to, to pontificate about black metal and all the paradoxes that go with it. I've got some issues with the movie. Uh, but I made sure to say that, like, you need to take this further and you need to listen to The Mysterious because that will put it all into perspective. Like, as, you know, what came out of all of this is really important to us. Um, but, you know, as a Norwegian, how, how did you, how did, what was your kind of taking the hand? What was your sort of investment in it? Um, I've also waited to see it. I haven't seen it yet because I wanted everything around it to calm down. Um, because I too know some of the guys, but also too young to actually have lived through those times and knowing what went on. So I understand that people that actually were involved in it can feel somewhat, I don't know, hurt or not liking it being done, but at the same time, it's uh, not a documentary, it's a movie based on a story a lot of us know. So I want to watch it, but I'm not going to watch it as a documentary or a truth. I'm tr it's weird enough that they're like talking English. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and wearing wigs. Um, so what surprised me, or it didn't surprise me actually, it showed um, how many people that had uh, an opinion about it that don't know any of the guys at all. It could be this random Greek guy just uh, throwing out, he would never say that. Aisden would never say that. He wouldn't have done that. And I was like, okay, you're 19 and you never met him. Why do you have an opinion about this? So. It created um, a discussion, at least, and also showed all the people that th think they know Mayhem or the guys just because they've listened to their music. And that's also a kind of interesting aspect to, um, to the movie, to, to see what people that didn't know them feel that they think they know. Yeah, if that gives um, sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to sort of ask if anyone in the audience has any questions. Um, you yeah. definitely have a question. Can you say that again since this is going yeah. to be recorded? So, yeah, yeah. So, why, so why is Metal so obsessed with the past? Um, we're at Midgard's book. I'm just going to point this out. So um, it's quite a re relevant question, I think. Um, Eva, 
as the man who's been doing this for the longest time? You're, you, you know, as far the time? I think it's, it's uh, actually pretty closely connected with the whole concept of Midgasblut, that it gives a sense of belonging to a longer tradition, uh, to belonging to, uh, to a scene, you know, like we all wrote ridiculous stuff when uh, Lemmy passed away, because you have this close relationship. I think it's also wider than just metal. It's just metal or better than maybe to express it sometimes. But when you see that they're trying to sell um, uh, these CDs uh, now, the absolute 90s and stuff, I'm like, why would anybody want to remember the 90s? You have the Mysteries, you can listen to that. Forget about the rest of the 90s. Uh, but um, I think it's because as people, we like to go to have this remembrance, sort of like how you felt, how, how your life was when, when Iron Maiden was, uh, was big and all that stuff. Because uh, I guess that's how we're wired that things were always better before. And I think that's uh, especially strong in, in the metal, uh, metal thing. So I think it's a good balance to have this, the, the traditionalists. And I'm a little bit, I'm kind of curious to see what the next uh, generation of ACDCs and motorheads and all that, what that's going to be like. Will really there be a next generation of ACDCs? Is that, is that kind of big rallying point gone? in a kind of a very atomized modern era? It's my personal um, will, we thought, will we ever have another ACDC or Motorhead? I think that instead of being like, the big, like those five gigantic bands touring, there will be maybe 20 or 30 semi-gigantic bands going around, and then there will be a Slipknot and a Five Finger that cannot be mentioned. Uh, and all this stuff happening at the same time, so maybe the stadium uh, days are over, but that's not, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. I mean, they are. I mean, obviously, you know, your books are kind of creating a narrative. And, you know, like I said, the point I wanted to make at the beginning was that, you know, we see metal as a continuity. It's not just the past, but it's been able to... It's like having a tree with soil, you know, you, you, need, the rich, you need that rich soil uh, for something to kind of... to, to continue. Um, so, how do you see... Um, you, you, you do a couple of old school bands, but you also you're putting on gigs for like a lot of new bands. And so, how how would you see like are the are the bands of the gigs that you're putting on? Um, are they obsessed with the past? Are they kind of forward looking? Are they kind of doing something new for black metal that you couldn't have done back then? I mean, I think black metal and um, metal in general it, it, it is obsessed with the past on one level, but it, I don't think it's held holds itself to the past. I think the dynamic of metal is that it's constantly evolving and, you know, finding new forms of expression. But the, the beauty of it is it's also tied to a sort of sense of traditionalism and even conservatism. I think that's actually what makes uh, metal in, as a whole, and especially black metal, such a vital genre. Is it, it's constantly in both directions. So I think bands, I don't think there's a problem with bands stagnating, because every year, you know, we hear a black metal band doing something we never would have expected before, but which is still obviously inherently black metal. Um, and even within death metal, which is, I'd argue, a slightly more limited genre, there's still new sound and band. So I don't think it's necessarily a problem of stagnation, but I think it's generally positive that new bands do understand that link to the past and kind of, um, I think it actually helps you to be original if you know what people have done before to some extent. It's yeah. not, you know, it's, it's not yeah. purely like looking to the past is going to make you a part of I think, you know, all art is a critique of what went on before it, you know, it, it, it's your reassessment of it and that's how you make creative mistakes and... Yeah. And I think the other thing is you can't really force people to, you know, obviously with, with the books, I'm hoping, you know, I, I really encourage people to look at the past, which I think um, what most of the people in this room, you know, that, that is the interest. But there will be some people who are just kind of casually into, into heavy metal um, and, and they probably won't buy it. That's okay. You, know, you need some of that, those people too. Uh, you know, so I go to a lot of festivals. Um, you know, the, the two, the, the, the two or three that mean really a lot to me: Midgarge Blur, um, Roadburn. Um, you know, I used to go to Holden Sky that's now beyond the gates. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're festivals where they have a spirit that you know. The minute you walk in, walk into the physical arena, you feel it. And so it's something that becomes very much more than the sum of its parts. And when you're there, like you said, you, you just know you're here for the set for 
something very personal, but something very common at the same time. And you know, having a ritual is such a binding thing. I mean, you had, you know, you said you, you had a Jewish background. You know, I had a Jewish background. I, um, I love, I love ritual on a really basic level. That and on a Friday night you do the Sabbath, and it's one time when your family would all be together, um, or just you know sitting and watching in front of the TV. So you know these things are scalable. They can, you know, they're important from a very basic level to, you know, a big, um, much more kind of broader spiritual level. You know, as above, so below. <laughs> Is yes. it, sorry, is it possible to get a microphone to the people asking questions? Yeah. Yeah, because we're Thank recording you. this. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, the lady in the green. So just to mirror was, what was said earlier about the openness, not necessarily the ceremony, but the overall thing. This one next to me here, we met the first time two years ago, sitting next to a bonfire. We drove across Norway last year together. We're going to do it again together. So, with also his partner. So. The um, welcome home part is very important because this is how it feels for real. Uh, coming from France, my experience on metal festival is basically Hellfest, which is cool, but too many people, and not my family. Here I feel like the first time I came here, I was like, okay, I can wear Viking gear and everyone gets normal. And I come to that at home because I'm a teacher and uh, also. And um, yeah, basically it's being, being ourselves here, so thank you so much. Yeah, what he's, what he's saying is that he bought his three-year festival band, special band that uh, only a hundred uh, very different festival bands can use. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there is, there is a big debate about festivals, like where the, who the next headliners are going to be. Uh, and I'm sure, like, you know, through work we go to, like, big festivals and boutique festivals such as this. Um, is it, do you think that festivals such as this are going to have difficulties finding headliners in the future? I mean, well, we keep talking about, like, you know, with, with, with a big corporate festival like Download or, or probably Wacken, they don't care. It's, it's Germany. But with Wacken, you know, or with, 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 say, Download in the UK or the big festivals, they're wondering where the big is going to be. But when is that apocalypse going to actually hit? It's not. Yeah. So, there's a renewal, like the, the festivals that were dreading, the, when uh, like Judas Priest and Opus Band says we're going to quit first, they didn't quit before they came back. But like, there's actually too many headliners on the market for festivals next year. Oh wow! So they have actually too many options to choose from. So that's not, it's not happening anytime soon. And when it comes to festivals like that, like Highland was nowhere two years ago. I don't think there's a market where the gap will be filled. There will be bands. The, the scene is creative enough. There will somebody. There will be somebody to fill the shoes. So I'm not worried about that. And those festivals with an identity, like Roadburn, we just brought the other guys you mentioned, very here to stay. Yeah, I'm not worried about them at all. I, they will just grow organically, yeah. slowly. You know. I, I think I, I kind of want to make, make sort of one kind of. I think like you know, we have to kind of come together to kind of create a creative environment. Uh, I mean, I've been working in the music press since. 89 and, uh, and I, I, one thing I've learned is that you know the press gets music that it deserves and then and the music gets the press that it deserves so if you lower the bar you're going to get very average bands if you agitate and you can articulate a kind of a slightly bit more of a higher aim for music other bands will get it there, there's a symbiotic relationship and I think like something like this coming here kind of to create an creative environment but whatever it is, we, are, we understand something fundamental about it is um, an amazing thing. And long may that continue to the future, from the past to the present to the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I think that must be famous last words. We have uh, used up all our time. But I would like to thank you as a panel. Uh, having you here is very special to Midgash Blot. You're all people who works hard in the industry and that inspires us in this festival to create what we do for you, our audience and our family. Um, also, like for me personally, I'm, I'm like so, so excited you are here, Jonathan, editor of Metal Hammer UK. Review for me, editor. I was... <laughs> I missed it last I, year and it pained me so much, I can't let that happen again. Happy to have you here now, but I was going to say, I was um, this 12-year-old 12, 12 girl living in northern Norway and no metal bands ever came there. And, uh, well, the, yeah, if you were into metal, what should you do? I mean, 
I could get the monthly Metal Hammer UK from uh, the local kiosk. So that was the highlight of my month. And I also did some tape trading. Probably 96 kronos. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, that taught me English uh, and music. So thank you for that. Um, also, we're having two of the Norway's uh, big radio shows here today with Susanne from Radio Rock and Helle from Jernverke. And as girls uh, and metalheads, they have played a big influence on what's going on in the music scene in Norway. And uh, Ivar, of course, being a big figure in both Enslaved and the later Skuksho and Hugsho project, as well as his own electronica project, Bartspec. He's also a main figure, and, and like his historical interest and his, uh, your close relationship with Midgarsbrot is a big asset to us. And um, Michael Barbarian is um, very important as heading Seasons of Mist, and uh, together with Midgarsbrot, we, we agree that we like acquired tastes. When people ask, how can you listen to that? Do you even know what they're singing? <laughs> then I'm first like, it's like blue cheese and red wine. You need to get used to it and then you'll love it. And finally, Dial, um, a really uh, important figure in bringing a voice to the history of metal and kind of educating people. This is why we have the music seminars here and the other seminars too, is because we believe that if you have a certain knowledge, you can understand things and people better. So thank you so much. I have a present for you all. Big hand to them all. Just one moment. Well, not against water lot. <laughs> What they're getting is a bag with some goodies from the Midgar Viking Center and uh, Midgar Splut. And also they're getting the Mimi Talks poster with their name on it. So now they can be rock stars too. You already are one, but... Uh, <laughs> but still. Yeah. I'll say, like, Eva is also was, like, central to the, central to the uh, foundation of... Um, Mikhail's Blut, because Mikhail's Blut is based around eight silver boots, yes. which was, uh, I don't know if anyone knows the history of this, um, it was not to commemorate the um, 200th anniversary of the Constitution, but to have a little go with it. You know, and Skuksha was created, um, you know, in response to the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Correct me if I'm wrong, because it, it kind of cemented Christianity, and it was held outside the... Uh, Wait. Oh my! Divine invention. And Dial, was, Dial already got his present. I'm not being mean yeah, to him. Yeah. But it was held. It was held outside the building where the constitution was signed, uh, next to a next to a festival that was kind of celebrating it. We should have gone to war, but yeah. And Mikos book came, you know, came out of that. So that first ace of the book was you premiering Skuggshaw, Roger and a statement, and Mikos book was the uh, successor. So thank you, Ivar, and thank you, everybody on the panel. And thank you to all of you who's been there so faithfully every morning, all throughout the days, listening to the seminars and contributed with wonderful questions. We have a day left down in the festival area. The weather forecast has said it should stop raining and the sun should come out. So let's cross our fingers for that happening. But I know we're going to have a good time anyway. So thank you for your attention this year. I'll see you next year in the same place, same time. But for now, we need to um, do some headbagging. Yeah. That's pretty That's pretty You've heard a recording of the Midgårdsbrot music panel of 2019. Next week, I'll play you a chat with Entombed AD, unfortunately in Swedish. Och det är väl kanske den enda punkten i universum som Norge faktiskt är li- lite, lite, lite bättre än Sverige är på Black Metal-sidan. If you like what you've heard, I've done another all-English special with Dimmeborger. 
There are also several interviews in English, like a Girl School, Grave Miasma, Vulture, Ken Hensley, Malakoid Patan, Faust Coven, Necros Christos, Svarti Dodi, and more. All with better sound quality than this one. <laughs> Subscribe to Järnverke in your podcast app or go to järnverke.com to listen. And if you feel extra kind, it's possible to donate through patreon.com slash järnverke. How? Just click the link at the bottom of the episode description. And remember to follow Järnverke on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. My name is Hella Stenkrov and I'm presenting new and old heavy metal interviews every Friday. Thanks for listening.